Hello and welcome. Today we have with us the wonderful Samira Qureshi and Samira is reviving Islamic traditions of the soul for sexual health education and therapy services. Her work is geared towards Muslims and the professionals who serve them, but I guess the best person to tell us a bit more about yourself is of course yourself. So welcome to the show Samira and yeah um, to get started. Thank you, Jessica. I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you. And yeah, I've worked at this interesting space of sexual health with Muslims for about 14, 15 years. And it was never my intention to do this work. It just mm -hmm. kind of happened. So I'm really happy that I can share a little bit about my work and we can chat about this overall. Yeah, amazing. I guess, firstly, it'd be great to start about with how you kind of got into this space. You said you weren't expecting to get into this space. So yeah, a bit more about your background would be brilliant. Yeah, so I was a school-based therapist many years ago in Canada and I started working in private Islamic schools, so religious schools. And I was working on mental health with kids and families and started to notice they were having sexual health questions and issues too. Um, and the schools were not really having confidence in how to address this with the kids. They just yeah. didn't know how. Um, so I thought we could develop some curriculum with Islam and, and sexual health content for kids and parents. And so I started doing that work and was mentored by somebody in that field. And from then on, I was, I was like, I really enjoy this. I really love educating about this topic. And then I started going into young adults right? Because sexual health is with us our whole life. So I went into healthy relationships and abuse prevention and reproductive health. And so since then, I've just been focusing on that as my career and now in private practice. So I'm really glad to be providing therapy services and yeah. education because it's something that I've been doing for most of my career. And I think to be able to gear it to Muslims, um, it, it's really awesome to be able to do that. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. I mean, having just to look through your site and your Instagram, for example, there's so much interesting content on there that I would advise all listeners to have a look at, I think. Um, but in terms of that, what issues through your work have you found that with Muslim women commonly face in regards to their sexual and reproductive health? What kind of the common themes that you found? Yeah, I would say they're no different than other populations. They just show up in different ways, right? So a lot of women, including Muslim women, are not empowered or educated about their body. Um, there's oftentimes this thought that they have to wait until they are of marriable age or if they are wanting to have kids to work on, address their body. Mm -hmm. They're not really seeing their bodies as prevention. Um, they're seeing it as when something goes wrong, then I have to deal with it. And so the baseline level of knowledge, of empowerment, of what is healthy, unhealthy, when to seek professional services, I think Muslims in general are not empowered with that. Um, and so it's no different than other women. It just shows up in different ways in terms of, well, is this permissible for me to learn about as a Muslim? Yeah. And so people really, I think, put up their own barriers when they try to become empowered about their bodies. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's so interesting. I think, yeah, you've kind of touched on it a bit there, but what do you think are some of the reasons for these issues? I mean, obviously we have the gender health gap and that's a yeah. massive reason why women in general, I think, yeah, what kind of, of the reasons and the barriers that you've kind of come across during your work? Yeah, I think, first of all, misunderstanding religion. So people often think religion is a barrier and a problem, but actually religion encourages us to take care of our body because it's really important. So a lot of women misunderstand religion. I think shame is a universal feeling that women deal with. So this feeling of their bodies being wrong or unworthy or dirty or shameful is so, so common. And I deal with a lot of women who face that. Yeah. And I also think a lot of fear and anxiety because when our sexual and reproductive health isn't talked about, it feels like it's separate from who we are. Mm. So then it feels like, well, this is something to be nervous about and scared about because I can't, you know, learn about it or, or take care of it. So yeah. I think those are some of the biggest reasons. And I think who to go to, like which healthcare provider, is it my primary care family physician? Is it an ob -GYN? Is it somebody else? And finding a sensitive provider can be hard because mm. sometimes there's misconceptions. And so a lot of Muslim women are thinking, who do I go to? And what if they 
what if they have biases against me or it, it there's a lot of uncertainty I think in that respect too yeah a hundred percent agree I think for women across the spectrum I think a lot of the time the vagina is seen as just something that something goes in into or out of and nothing else but I think that element of self-care for oneself is really like neglected a lot of the time as well so completely agree with that I think from your standpoint do you think that there's any barriers in particular that Muslim women face because we've obviously touched on the general um barriers that women tend to face I don't know if you find anything particular in your work or the particular questions that women come to you with yeah yeah I I think one of the biggest ones is women thinking that they're not permitted religiously to take care of their bodies before marriage So there's this idea that, like you said, the vagina is limited to sexual intercourse. And because Muslims have values about that, they think, well, well, then everything in terms of my vagina is off limits until marriage. Mm. So I think that's a big barrier is the misunderstanding of the impermissibility part of things. And so it's so much of my work is reducing and trying to get rid of that because that's it's not true. And I think a lot of the messaging that Muslim women may receive is indirectly, um, but also directly sometimes from their families, you know, not really empowering them to go seek support and and to learn about their bodies. Yeah, definitely. I think that indirect messaging is something that, yeah, all women face as well. I think that's, yeah, it's a pervasive issue. What kind of things do you say, what kind of strategies do you give to women to kind of combat these unintended or intended biases that you kind of that they're faced with each day yeah for me as I've worked throughout my career I've shifted my approach okay I definitely now use a very religious approach because I think that's the one of the only things that places women at ease when they're Muslim so I often talk about the fact that while God gave us one body and we have a responsibility to take care of it all parts of it And that that includes our menstrual cycle, understanding about our reproductive hormones, our health, family planning. So I use religion. And I think what that does is because that's our worldview as Muslims, it places a lot of women at ease. And it kind of counteracts all of the other messaging like family and and patriarchy and society, right? Mm. So I think that's so, so empowering because then when it's your faith tradition, that just gets to the root of it. Then you feel empowered and you're like, well, I'm doing this for my body because I want to take care of what's been given to me. And I think that is really, really powerful. Yeah, that's really, really important, I think. And what do you think the kind of benefits to having this empowerment with your body are? What kind of yeah results have you seen with your clients? Yeah, what I see is this newfound sense of confidence. So a lot of women when you become empowered about your body, you have language, you know what's going on, you know if there's issues and you're seeking support, it's confidence with your body. And I tell women, if you're not confident with your own body, how on earth can you then be intimate with somebody else? You know, it's almost like too much. You have to really be grounded in your body and being comfortable with it. And so I I have seen so much more confidence and empowerment the way women show up and the, the words they're using, they're confident with their healthcare providers, they're confident with their spouses if they need to be, or even when they're seeking a spouse, they're now more assertive because they have language and knowledge about their body. They're yeah. not relying on somebody else to educate them. They've done it themselves. And that is just amazing to see. And it's a lot of work to get there. It's yeah. a lot, a lot of work, but I, I love seeing women go through it. And I've been through it myself. And I I just, I, I can't even explain how empowering it is really and how grounded you feel, like knowing yeah. what you need to know. Yeah, oh, I love that. So do you kind of, are you saying you kind of give them the religious framing and language so that they can empower themselves with their health and with everything else? Yes, so we go and start with, this is what Islamic perspectives are about why we need to take care of our bodies. And then I add in the reproductive and sexual health information. So depending on their age, what life stage they're at, what they weren't taught, then we actually start the path of, this is what you need to know, and this is what you need to do, and this is where you need to go for help. So it's kind of missing 
filling in the missing information and having them do it. So I'm not, you know, doing it for them. They're the ones that are doing it and I'm supporting them. Oh, I love that. That's so good. I think, um, you mentioned at kind of a bit earlier on about how you say God has given us this body to take care of, for example, what other kind of scriptures or texts or information do you tend to use to help women? Mm. So there is quite a few related to um, the practical, there's guidelines on practical ways Muslims live their life. And when you look at the reasons for these guidelines, one of them is actually preservation of health and life. Mm -hmm. So that is huge because I don't think we realize that as Muslims, that we actually have a responsibility to take care of our health and life. And that doesn't mean that we sit and wait until something happens. (laughs) It doesn't mean that we just are passive. Islam is very much a religion of being active, right? Mm -hmm. We've been given a brain and we've been given these resources. We need to use them. So I often talk to women about play your part, do your part, and then kind of leave the rest. And Mm so um, that I think is important, this active nature of taking care of yourself. It's not meant to be reactive. And it's not meant to be passive. It's meant to be proactive and active. Mm. Definitely. I couldn't agree with that more. I think that preventative care is definitely the way that society, I hope, is moving towards at least because we can't wait until something goes wrong. I agree. It's completely the wrong approach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, kind of like it, if, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it, yeah. which works for like objects, but not for our body. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I completely agree. And related to that, I guess, shame is such a you and fear of of our bodies I think it's such a universal barrier that so many women face uh, particularly when it comes to their bodies and particularly with regards to their vagina and sexual health how can how do you help women kind of unlearn this and kind of integrate a new approach to their body into their lives because it can be hard sometimes to really unlearn that when we're exposed to it so often it can be really really tough and it's a lot of work I often break this down into stages for women. So the first thing I tell women to do is number one, put language to your shame. So shame often exists when it's undefined. It just feels really overwhelming and it feels like it's attached to who you are as a person. So when you're able to define shame clearly, like I feel shame because, or I am ashamed about Mm. Now you're, you know what you're working with, right? So that's the first step. Then the second step is to figure out, well, why? And where did this come from? Mm. Was it from family messaging, the community? Was it from fearful content online? You know, there's so much stuff out there that's just not accurate in terms of health information. So I, I often tell people, where did you learn this from? And then the next part is like, okay, how do we start to begin to claim our bodies? So how do we undo those initial shame scripts? Mm. So often that starts with basic education, like, okay, let's just start with anatomy and physiology. Yeah. And then let's start creating more positive relationships towards your body. So my body is amazing because, or I'm taking care of my body because. Mm. So now we've gone from shame to actually empowerment and it being positive. Mm. So I think it's not meant to be a linear cycle, but it's a a cycle. It's not a linear process, it's a cycle. So define the shame, um, where did it come from, get information and then rewrite that narrative. And then just as long as you keep doing that, Mm. you're constantly processing the shame instead of just letting it be there and then trying to just push through it, which I don't think works very well. Mm. yeah you've kind of already answered my next question but I was going to say when it's such pervasive feelings of shame or fear like coming from the entirety of society a lot of the times how do you kind of keep maintain that empowerment and maintain that positive feeling because I know yeah as a like women in general you're constantly under this kind of not attack but yeah these this messaging from the rest of society so how do you kind of address that and keep that going yeah I well I tell women first of all be careful what you access online like really watch what you're reading because I think that's the first level of control is and that's what I do even who I follow and what I look at online I'm very very intentional about it I refuse to even look at content that's wrong because I mean as a professional I'd want to 
correct it, but then you're always kind of just having to deal with that. So um, I follow good, solid accounts and information. And then the second thing to do is the more knowledge you have yourself, you can push back against what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. My problem and my concern is when people just are sponges and there's nothing to push back. Yeah. But the more you educate yourself and then you see something, you're like, no, um, that, that's not accurate. So, mm. Because I know that this and I learned it from a credible source. Yeah. So I would say that that's one of the best ways to push back is empower yourself. Mm. And then you can easily like I easily push back when I see stuff. And I'm like, no, that's not accurate. I'm not going to take it to be true. Yeah, that's really interesting. I feels like you've kind of developed an approach as you've gone along as well. And I know you said earlier that you kind of started with one approach and have shifted more towards another could you tell me a bit more about that? What's kind of driven you to work in a particular way as opposed to the way that you started yeah. off with? Yeah, I think when I was a newbie in this field, I would kind of rely on regular sexual health content and then kind of add Islam into it, which is yeah. very common, right? And then as I started working more and more, it was a few years ago that I'm like, well, wait a second, we're kind of missing a spiritual framework. We're missing the soul, which is so important to how Muslims live and understand themselves. So I think that led me to want to flip the script almost yeah. um, so that we're starting with the soul and what Islam teaches us. And then we add in the sexual and reproductive health information. Yeah. So what that does is it places Muslims, first of all, at ease, but also it ties back to how they live. Like Islam is just, as a Muslim, it's everything that you see and do. Yeah. So why not start there? And then that gives them the language to then seek the information. Mm. So it already kind of deals with the shame as well, because when you learn religious perspectives it kind of places the shame aside completely because you're like oh there's my answer it's okay like yeah. our, our bodies need to be taken care of so I've noticed a big difference in how people are responding to to this approach hmm. versus before where it was it was responded to well but I felt like I had to work harder to prove it Islamically yeah but now I'm like it's in our religion so let's just start there instead of hmm. adding it in later on yeah, definitely. And how has your response been to your work been in general? How has the response been in general to your work? Yeah, I would say for the most part, it's it's positive and people are very open. I think they're feeling affirmed that there is a compassionate, holistic way to take care of themselves that's not shameful and not fear based. Yeah. Um and there are people who I would say are uncomfortable. Um, and I see that as a representation of just where they're at, right? Um, it's, a, it's a lot, it can be difficult to do inner work. It's not easy to undo shame, right? It, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of work. So for those people who are maybe not agreeing with my content or they feel like it's too much, so they're pushing back, I'm like, it's where you're at and it's okay. And I'll say 95% of the time, um it's been positive so I have to remember that um because the negative stuff tends to take over sometimes <laughs> yeah no it's hard to it's hard to sometimes focus on it but I agree I think your approach is such a positive approach anyway that I think that kind of limits some of the negative comments that you may be receiving yeah. because you are just preaching positivity and a holistic care and approach so it's hard to kind of it's hard to hate on that although yeah <laughs> I'm sure some yeah. people try um, yeah and I guess for women listening to this podcast, whether Muslim or not Muslim, yeah. how do you think they could start by taking better care of their sexual and reproductive health? Yeah, I often um, give some questions to women who ask this of me. The first is to ask yourself, what do I know about my body and what information is missing? Yeah. So because you want to start with where you're at. And as women, we're probably at different places, um, even though we're missing a lot of information. Um, the second part is to then think about, well, what life stage am I in, mm -hmm. right? 20s, 30s, 40s, um, seeking a partner in a relationship, married. And then based on that, like what's missing, right? Um, and to ask, also ask yourself, like, do I have any sexual or reproductive health issues? Mm -hmm. Even things like, what am I noticing about my menstrual cycle, my hormonal changes, you know, my, my vaginal health, um, any sort of pain or irregular discharge, I think just the basic fundamental kind of self-check can be helpful. 
And then the third thing I tell women is, do you have a trusted provider? Um, do you have somebody that you can go to and build a relationship with about your body and to seek information from? So I, I think starting from a bit of a self-assessment mm. and then asking yourself, like, what is the current state of your sexual and reproductive health? And if you don't know, then what can you do to seek information and services? You might need some professional help to kind of get your knowledge going a little bit. Yeah, that's really good. I think that self-reflection is so important as well because so many people and women in particular just will ignore their symptoms or ignore their common problems. And I think push them aside. And I think that encouragement to actually listen to your body is super important. What kind of have been like the common, have you had like common issues pop up or like common themes? Yeah. With when women undergo this self-reflection or yeah, in your work, what would, what would you kind of see pop up? Yeah, I, I would say a couple of themes. One is, I think, difficulty or pain with uh, sexual intercourse. Yeah. I think a lot of women do experience pelvic pain. Um, and unfortunately, it's normalized a little too much in terms of, oh, it's going to be painful. But then also when it is painful, they're not sure what to do. So that's a one big issue that I'm seeing. Yeah. The second, I would say, is um, concerns with menstrual cycle and, and I think vulva health overall. So it could be like excessive heavy bleeding, pain, bleeding outside of the menstrual cycle. Mm. Um, also like recurrent infections, vulva pain, yeah. um, sensitivity, like the things that I think we we know deep inside is not healthy. Yeah, But I think the shame and just thinking about getting help and kind of it's very vulnerable, right? Our yeah. sexual health is very, very vulnerable. So I think those are common concerns that I'm seeing. And then in general, women who just have no insight about their cycle and their health. Yeah. So not understanding their hormones, um, tracking their cycles, um, and, they, and, they, and they want a family plan potentially, and they're just not mm. aware of things. I think that's also problematic. Like, so even the fundamental information is is missing is what I'm noticing. Yeah, definitely. I think, well, with my work at Screaming, we see a lot of women come through the doors with those particular issues and not even knowing about certain things like the vaginal microbiome, for example, I think is so, it's interesting to see what a lack of education there is about something so important for women's yeah. health. Um, but I think, I guess, Going back to the first point you made, so the pain, the pelvic pain, how do you kind of coach women through that as an issue? Yeah, the first thing I do is a lot of education to give yeah. them language to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I explain potentially why they're experiencing pain. I normalize that a lot of women go through this and it's not okay to have pain. Yeah. So because they, oftentimes women have been told it's in their head. It's mm -hmm. because they're not sexually experienced. They need to relax more. I'm like, that's all just not true. Yeah. There's probably physical, physiological reasons in the pelvic floor. So when they get that information, I automatically just see women being like, oh, okay, this is happening for a reason. Yeah. It's not because I haven't been sexually active, you know, and it's not just a matter of relaxing. I'm like, no, it's not. There's probably something going on. And then I do refer them to professionals. So I work with them on breathing techniques and mindfulness because we know that that really helps in mm. terms of grounding and, and with the pelvic floor. And then I refer them to a pelvic floor specialist. Yeah. So it could be a physiotherapist. It could be an ob gyn to begin with, a pelvic pain doctor. So then I'm referring them out. So they're seeking the, the pelvic support they need. And then I'm kind of coaching them in the background and dealing with the other mental health spiritual health stuff that comes up and if they're married for example there's there can be difficulties in the marriage so I'm kind of the therapist from that regard and then they're also seeking help and so we're able to just keep that loop going yeah and then I'm able to support them as they receive treatment yeah that's yeah I think that's really important I think what you said about how often I mean intercourse is just normalized for many women as being painful which is just outrageous and then the fact that that's tied up with the fear and shame and discourses yeah. around that, I think that definitely plays into it as well. And I think that work alongside practitioners that you're doing, I think really works. And I think that's like the holistic approach that I think people, yeah, should definitely go down. I think you mentioned about um, couples 
and yeah if there's a part a male partner involved do you work a lot with men at all or do you yeah do you how does that kind of come into your work yeah I do I've been noticing I'm working with more couples than usual so I'm like okay yeah. that's great I really love working with couples so yeah. I do so I I'll work with couples together because if a woman is experiencing pelvic pain, we're going to have to modify intimacy a little bit and we're going to have to get better at communication and supporting one another. Yeah. And then I also know that for, for male partners, it can be challenging because a lot of them feel like I'm causing my wife pain. And also I have, I, I want to connect with my wife in this way and I want her to experience pleasure. Yeah. So I sometimes will do individual counseling as well. So I'll work with the the, the male partner and kind of process some of those feelings and then help him kind of work through them otherwise they remain bottled up yeah and it can affect the relationship right mm. um, because what tends to happen is men pull back they don't want to hurt their partner so they show kind of less initiation of intimacy less emotional intimacy yeah. we don't want that we just want to temporarily pause intercourse and then work on keeping the relationship solid. And mm. so whatever that takes with couples work and individual work is typically the approach that I that I use. Yeah. And do you just focus on the kind of intercourse side of things when it comes to men? Or do you how do you kind of integrate that education surrounding women's health in general into that yeah. conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I will I don't want the female partner to feel burdened to be the educator so I'll do that yeah. for her <laughs> so in our session I'll explain to the male partner this is what's happening yeah it's not your fault it's not her fault this is what is physiologically neurologically happening yeah so I often find men being like okay it's not me because they they tend to think they're causing pain because obviously it's during intimacy and intercourse mm -hmm. so they internalize it and I think that helps a lot. So I take the burden of educating and then also what feelings need to be processed. The, the, the female partner is not the therapist. So mm -hmm. I try and kind of alleviate that so they can focus on them as a couple, yeah. right? And then I kind of take on the educating, the processing and the support. And then I often give them kind of homework. So my therapy approach is very practical. Yeah. I'm like, we're going to meet for an hour. I'm going to give you homework. This is what yeah. I'd like you to do. And then we're going to check in three weeks or two weeks from now. And I think that's empowering because it's, talking for an hour doesn't do much. Yeah. We have to actually work on things. And I think that is where therapy needs to go. Um, so that's been really helpful to see couples say, we tried this pleasure activity or, and we tried these date nights and we emotionally communicated and it really helped. Yeah. So I think it's so awesome to see when couples put in the work um, because yeah. there are results that come out. No, that's really good. And I like that it's also not just about the intercourse itself, but also about the relationship in general and the communication. And I think that's, yeah, really important. I wonder whether, do men then become more curious or do you give them more information surrounding other women's health issues? Or is that so potentially like menopausal or other issues that women may have? Does that kind of expand their knowledge in that sense? It does. So apart from the pelvic pain topic, yeah. I work with a lot of couples who struggle with intimacy in general. Mm -hmm. We know that sexual desire changes, there's hormonal changes when you have kids, stress, life, family stuff. So I do find myself educating men a lot about female sexuality. Yeah. So this is what sexual desire is. This is what pleasure and arousal are. And we need to prepare for intimacy. We can't always just jump into it a lot of the times, even though you may be ready for that. So a lot of it is, I think, for them eye-opening because it confirms what they've been experiencing and why. Yeah. So it, it, I do find men to be open with it. And also they then get more information to feel empowered. Um, in terms of what to do right and how to yeah, change definitely. no that's good and I also feel like it's nice that that's kind of the gateway in um to expanding their knowledge about female health in general and even their own health in general and communication yeah so I think it's super beneficial and that's yeah it's super super interesting I like that it's brings the couple in together as well it's super yeah super good um yeah I guess that kind of brings me relatively to the end of my questions. Um, is there anything else that you want to say to our, obviously attach all of your socials below and encourage anyone to have a look at your site, have a look at your Instagram, reach out to yourself because you've got a load of 
really, really informative um, content on there, which is super, super interesting. Um, but yeah, any final words from yourself at all? I don't, I don't know. I think we covered so much in this half an hour <laughs> podcast. We talked about so much, which is awesome. You, you know, the questions you ask. Yeah, I just really encourage people to prioritize this part of their health. Whether you're listening as a woman or a man, I, I think it's so important to prioritize this part of your health and and to be okay to reach out for support and, and services from, from those who provide it. Yeah, 100%. Could not agree more. And thank you so, so much for coming on. It was wonderful having you. Yeah, lovely to chat, Jessica. And I'm excited for our ongoing kind of collaboration and to support the work at Screen Me as well. Yes, for sure. Everyone should stay tuned for incoming content. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs>